the, uh, whoa, uh, the video of the veterans. Uh, see all of you so young. Look at you. <laughs> no, it's awesome. I, it, I'm so thankful. My, uh, both my grandfathers served in the military. My one grandfather was actually at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Um, lots, of, lots of things happened that he never really wanted to talk about. Um, but just the fact that he served and served so graciously um, and, and the fact that there's so many of you that spent time in the military, spent time over there, lost people that you knew, um, we're thankful for you. We're so thankful. So this morning, if you have your Bibles, open them to James 4. We're going to, I thought I was going to go all the way through James 4, but we're not going to quite make it all the way through James 4 this morning. So, uh there's the modern Catholic and Episcopalian liturgies actually contain something called the passing of the peace or passing the peace. The idea is that you stand up, you walk around, you shake each other's hand, you say, peace be with you, and then they respond, peace be with you. Uh, this is, uh, we have, you know, done that a little bit more modern version in a lot of churches today where we just walk around and shake each other's hands and say good morning. Uh, there was a church in New York, though, that um, didn't like this passing of the peace. Uh, they didn't like it because they didn't like each other. They didn't want to say, peace be with you, and they didn't want anybody else to say, peace be with you, because they had grudges with one another. And this is a well-known, well-told story among pastors. I've heard it at a number of conferences. And what they decided, they decided together, which is impressive, um, that they had decided together to get rid of the guy that was their priest because he kept making them do it. And they went and found somebody else that was actually a little bit more accommodating to their desires of not doing this anymore. So they could go on being angry about the things that, you know, church people are angry about, like, that's my pew, wrong color carpet, I wish we had chairs, not pews, whatever uh, that it might be. But this morning, we're going to talk about the fact that uh, in James, he's going after the fact of the warning against worldliness, warning against quarrelsome and, and, and anger and fights and other issues that were cropping up, not just in the church as a whole, but in individual believers uh, which was causing major issues. So if you are able to stand, we are going to read James 4, 1 through 12. If you're not, that is fine also, but we will have it on the screen for you as well. So James 4, this is what the word of the Lord says. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace, therefore it says. God opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and one judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. Lord, again, as always, we pray that your word would do the work. We pray your spirit uh, who we know is among us, um, will move mightily in the lives of those in this room uh, to change us as we're supposed to be changed, um, to make us new, to call us into salvation, whatever it is this morning that you are speaking to us about. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So James goes right after as he continues to do. Remember, there's no breaks here. It's not like he's like, and another thing. Uh, it's just one continuous flow of one continuous letter. And he goes right after the heart for the reason of these issues. Again, 
everything in the book of James and really throughout Scripture is dealing with a heart issue. It's not if I can just do better. If my actions were just a little bit better than they were the last time, then I'll be better. It's a radical heart change. If your heart changes, those other things will fall in line. If your heart never changes, you might wake up one day totally motivated to do something and the next day totally not motivated to do it. You're just going to be on a roller coaster of emotions as opposed to a growth process in the Lord. And so it's a calling to a change of heart. And James is going after the issues because we've seen throughout James to this point that the church, remember he's writing to the believers, the dispersion, the Jews that have started these churches, he's writing to the churches and they've had a lot of issues. We have class conflicts in chapter 2, 1 through 11. There's rivals between each other to be the teachers in 1, 19 through 26 and 3, 1. There's bitter envy and selfish ambition in chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. We have praise and cursing coming out of the same mouth in 3, 9 through 10, among other issues. And so when we read, again, I hope that if you're staying with us and know, okay, well, he's doing chapter 4 of these verses, it's going to be this next. I pray that you're, you're reading these things and trying to figure out um, that all of it flows. So you're not just reading chapter 4, but you're going back into 3 and reading through 3 to get to 4 and then reading through 4 because there's a purpose behind it. So we have to have an understanding of, in verses in chapter 3, godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom. That's what James is trying to get across. He's saying, look, you have lived this way, you act this way, you talk this way, you treat each other this way. We're going to bless God with our mouth, and then we're going to you know, curse somebody else. But that's not how a believer should act, people. We should be acting with godly wisdom. And so it talks about godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom, that the tongue causes fires, in chapter 3, verse 5, that jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts will boast of false things and cause issues. He's kind of building up to the fact that, look, if you would use godly wisdom, these wouldn't be issues. Godly wisdom would change your heart, what causes fights and quarrels among you. So if the end to the truth of righteousness and being righteous is in Christ, in God, and godly wisdom, then the opposite of that of what's going to cause your, file, uh, your fights and quarrels is the, the striving, the stresses, the creating issues that really shouldn't be issues. This has gone on forever in the church. I mean, all the way back to the very beginning, clearly these are the first churches and they're still struggling with the same things all the way till now. We have all kinds of things that will divide us. And, and, and God says that that is absolutely against his will and his desire because if the church is divided, the world will see the division. I mean, we're so set on things that shouldn't be things that we're set on. Uh, when I first came, I talked about the fact that there are first tier, second tier, and third tier issues. First tier, you better stand for it. Like, you better believe that Christ is incarnate. You better believe that Christ is the only way to be saved by dying on the cross and raising again. If you don't believe those things, you're probably not saved. Those are like first tier, have to believe them, salvific issues. Tier two is probably not going to worship in the same building, but you can be my brother or sister in Christ. We may not agree on some things that the Bible goes back and forth about, but we'll, we'll agree that you're saved and I'm saved. Tier three is these are great things to have a conversation about. These are great things to get in depth about, to really dig into the word. And, and with my friends who are pastors, I love going to tier three stuff and just going back and forth and having fun, right? There's, there's a great video online about pedo baptism, which is infant baptism. And you have R.C. Sproul, and you've got a whole bunch of other, like John Piper and a number of other like big name guys on the stage discussing infant baptism. And they're going back and forth and kind of taking jabs at each other because they're friends and they're connecting in this way. And at the end, they go, you know what? We're still friends. God is still in control. This shouldn't divide us and make us enemies with each other. So therefore, we can agree to disagree and be brothers and love each other still. That's been an issue all the way throughout the history of the church. And some of these things are still going on today that were going on back then because we're making mountains out of molehills. We're causing division because of things that we desire or want to see. And it's really not necessary. So what causes fights then? If, if I could boil James down to what causes the issues, 
sinful human stupidity. And that encompasses all of us, right? That encompasses all of us. James uses the word desires here, and in fact, which in the Greek is the word we get our word hedonism from. So when he's saying desires here, it's not like, oh, I have a, I have a slight desire for food, right? This is hedonism. This is, I must be filled with this. I have to have this because I desire it to give me pleasure. It's so much more than desire. And so this is the issue. James is saying more accurately in this passage, it's the desires for pleasure among you that are causing these fights and these quarrels. And it's been the cause since day one until now. I mean, if we look at verses two through four again, you desire, you do not have, so you murder. You covet, you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. The search for pleasure has actually worked misery in the lives of these people and the desire for pleasure has worked misery in our own lives. Think about it. You have pursued pleasure and come to a dead end every single time in worldly pleasure. It causes misery within us. Remember, James is addressing the church and the believers. And obviously there's some in the congregation who are not believers. But even believers have conflicting desires. If you say, uh, which I watched a video this week, which I found highly uh, cringeworthy and somewhat entertaining, where a person was confidently boasting that she never struggles with sin anymore. She has reached peak faithfulness. The comment section was worth every bit of the time to read through. No, you haven't. We all struggle. We all have strife. We all have conflicting desires. We all have those things that seem to boil up within us. We desire the things of the world, but we're also supposed to be set apart from the world. We're supposed to be marked by our new life in Christ, and yet we have this old life that keeps wanting to rear its ugly head. It's, it's, we're putting it to death. We're trying to put it to death, but it's constantly there. Until we're made perfectly righteous in Christ, in death, in heaven, it's going to be glorious, it's going to be amazing. But until then, we're going to still struggle. So first, if you struggle with sin and strife in your life, number one, you're in the same boat as the rest of everybody else, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But that's not something to get comfort in. That's something to go, okay, I can now see that I'm the same with everybody else, but the Bible says there's more. I'm not supposed to stay in that boat and go, I'm relaxed and happy in that boat. It is to be driven towards sanctification and change for the good of yourself and the glory of God. Because in his glory, through your life, will come good. It says at the end, he will exalt you. So we're at war with the flesh. The old, seeking, uh, the old self-seeking sinful nature battles against the new one. We see that in Romans 7 and Galatians 5. In fact, the Bible tells us that we're literally against three, at war against three adversaries. We're at war with the world, we're at war with the flesh, and we're at war with the evil one or the devil. We're at war. War is not a pillow fight. War is vicious. As a number of people, as we've already stated in this room, you know firsthand. You know how vicious it can be. That's what we're talking about in the spiritual realm as well, that we take seriously, put to death, and go on the attack against our sinful, worldly flesh. Because all of this, whenever we seek these things, I mean, we are desiring, and the thing is, we struggle, we battle against other things. Like, we're not just coveting wealth. We're not just coveting stuff. We're not just coveting material things. We struggle, we strife, we covet other people's joy. We covet other people's happiness and peace. In fact, there's times where believers will literally be frustrated and whatever other thing you want to say against other people's joy. I don't know why they can be so joyful. And what it does is it causes relational war. I mean, that's what it tells us in verse 2. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and can obtain so you fight and quarrel. There are some that believe actually during this time that there's converted zealots in the Jewish churches that James is writing to. These are 
political zealots. These are Jewish zealots. These would have been aggressive people coming from the old nature, now born again and in the church, yet still living that old flesh. So there's probably some evidence. Well, there, I, I don't say probably some evidence. There is some evidence that more than likely these zealots were literally causing a harm to other people when they didn't agree with the zealots. And so there's this actual physical confrontation taking place, but there's even more so bitterness, strife, and envy. And so James is writing, this this can't be, number one, this can't mark you as a believer. This can't. If this marks you as a believer, I'm going to tell you, you're, you're probably not a believer, or you're a believer who has never understood that you're supposed to grow. When our individual lives are filled with conflict between the old and the new, it's going to spill over into our daily life. The way we talk to people, the way we engage others, the way we live our lives out, the way we drive our car, the things that we watch, the things that we put into our minds, it's going to spill over into our daily life. So do you lack joy? If you're a believer and you lack joy, I can almost guarantee you that you lack a personal walk with the Lord. That's not a shot. That's from someone who's lived it. That's from someone who has been in a moment of deep despair and joylessness and looking back, it was obvious, first and foremost, my walk with the Lord at that time wasn't there. My prayers were, man, if you could get me out of this one, or I sure would like this, or Lord, would you please help with, and I just kind of frivolously threw them up into the air, hoping he might grab one of them and go, I'll answer that one today. Instead of all out, wholeheartedness before the Lord saying, God, I am a sinner before a holy God. And recognizing that first and in my relationship with him, desiring the things of him more than I desire these other things. Because if I wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to have joy today, (laughs) the world will send you a special friend that will help you not have joy today. It always happens. Things will steal your joy if it's rooted in your tryheartedness. The world will steal it quickly. Do you lack hope and peace? I can almost guarantee you lack a personal walk with Jesus. The Bible over and over again tells us that our fleshly desires will ruin our prayer life. We will become prayerless because we have become joyless. James here says that we do not have because we do not ask, because we ask wrongly. We approach the Lord Almighty. I mean, think about who he is. And we approach him, like I said earlier, where I just kind of cast some things up, hoping that he will grab one of them and see fit to answer them. We walk in the same way before the Lord Almighty, that he is God Almighty, that if he was standing here, right? It's one of those things that I kind of compare, and this is, much on a, this is a low shelf explanation. I was squirrely as a kid, super squirrely as a kid. I had to stand by the wall at recess. I got lots of whoopings at home. Uh, I tried to forge my dad's name on my report card. Uh, So there's lots of things that I've done in my past. Don't do that. Um, I've done lots of things, lots of things. But I tell you what I didn't do. I didn't do it when my dad was standing there. I didn't do it then. Why? Because I knew that I should have respect, number one, respect for him. And number two, there would be some sort of thing come at me had I, had I done those things right in front of him. That's a low shelf explanation of, man, the Lord is present, ever present to the believer. He is everywhere at all times. And if we're a believer, he lives within us. The spirit lives within us. And yet we act like we're performing this in a bubble where God can't see. I know he's omnipresent, but not here. He doesn't see, he doesn't know, he isn't going to act. How can you hold the hand of the world and hold the hand of God at the same time? How can you hold the hand of your Lord and Savior, the one who saved you, the God who did so much to connect to us and to give us an opportunity at salvation and hold the world which is your mistress at the same time like anybody who saw that happen in real life 
holding the hand of a spouse and holding the hand of a mistress at the same time walking down the street would have major issues with this. The first and foremost would be the wife, I would think. But major issues, and this is what we're doing on a daily basis. The, world's, the word adulteress here is pointed because if you are a believer and desire the world instead, you are having an affair against God. James and Paul and the rest of the writers of the Bible aren't trying to make it land softly for you. It doesn't land softly for me. It's not supposed to. It's supposed to drive us to repentance and change. It's supposed to drive us back to Christ, back to Lord, back to the things that we're called to be. So when he says adulteress, it's pointed. That inner wrestling, those covetous thoughts, those longings will ruin you. It will rob you of your joy. It will take all those things that God has intended for you away because our eyes will slowly come down to the issues that are in front of us. It is a slippery slope. It will lead ultimately, and I'll be honest with you, to depression, actual mental and spiritual depression. Your seeking has led to emptiness. Emptiness Emptiness has led to joylessness. Joylessness has led to depression. And it's not overcome by trying harder or waking up that today is just going to be different because it is. It's overcome by humble repentance. Do you want joy in your life? Nope. Everybody would say yes. Humble repentance. What sins have you done against the Lord and others? Humble repentance. If you're unwilling to completely convey what's going on in your heart and life in front of the Lord, number one, with humble repentance, it's going to be hard to find joy and peace and hope and happiness because it's going to keep coming back again. Those Sins that for a long time I didn't confess before the Lord and others. That's why I have an accountability partner that knows me 100%. Because if you're 99% known, you're not fully known. So he knows everything. And I have confessed everything to him. And I've confessed it before the Lord. Because before I confessed it before the Lord, that was easy prey for the enemy. But once I've confessed it and laid it out, even if it's still somewhat of a struggle for me, I I have been redeemed from that. You have no ammunition here anymore. I know some in here might even be saying, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear this. I'm going to tell you, though, and this is the word of God, not me. How do you overcome these issues? It is overcome by prayerfulness. You've tried prayerlessness, and it hasn't worked. And it's overcome by a personal relationship in God's word, because this is what shapes and carves away. It is the sword. It carves away those things. It is shaping you. It is heavenly sandpaper to smooth away rough edges. However you want to look at it, the word of the Lord is what shapes and molds. And if you don't have it, or if it's just something you do kind of on the side, it will never change you. And if you're not a believer in here, you're like, how can a book change you? Because it's not just a book. It's the living word of God. You can't argue with the power of changed lives. No book in the history of the world, has truly changed a life. You might read a book and go, wow, I'm going to consider these things. I'm going to invest better. I'm going to do this better. I'm going to be happier. I'm going to be whatever. Those things, eh. But when you see murderers who have laid down their life before the Lord and are completely and radically changed, druggies. There was a guy in our last church who was a uh, massive druggie, had lots of issues. In fact, their house that they lived in was a house where everybody came to buy their drugs. They were dealing drugs. They were using drugs. It was a den of drugs, as he explained it. And God radically saved his wife and him. Radically. And that house became a house of prayer and worship 
and where they saw people redeemed back to the Lord. That doesn't happen from Tom Sawyer or Huckleberry Finn or whatever it's called. That doesn't happen. It happens because the word of God is alive and active and is breathed out by him and it can radically change and pierce us from within. And verse 4 tells us that we are at enmity with God. I, I think God will save all of us. I think universalism is true. I think if I just do enough good, what's the level? There's no bar that you can reach with goodness. We as believers, we live as enemies before God. Even though we're not, we're not enemies. He has saved us. He has redeemed us. But we act like it. We live like it. I mean, we're doing Veterans Day today. Imagine the idea of you putting on the enemy's uniform. Not for espionage. Not to do something sneaky to win the battle. You put on the enemy's uniform because it's more comfortable. That's what we're talking about here. That's the life that we're talking about here. When we live as an unbeliever, but are actually saved, we're at odds with the one who lives within us. And this can't be true. God desires good things for us. He has created pleasures for us. We, we get it so twisted that if I'm enjoying something, then I must be very sad about that because God wouldn't let me have... Are you kidding? I mean, James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord above. He's given those things. There's lots of them. I don't want to run down the list today. There's so many good things. In fact, most things in this world can be good things as long as the heart is correctly attached to them. Good gifts. And he means for us to enjoy them and find joy in him even through them. But we've exchanged the truth for a lie, as Roman 1 says. We seek other things instead of the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. Are, you. are you wanting joy and happiness? Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness to live rightly before him. Are you tired? Are you tired of fighting a losing battle? Because I know that some of you feel that way. You wake up, you're a believer, but you are fighting a losing battle because you're fighting it on your own. The battle of the world that you are choosing versus the Spirit is at work in you. This is a constant battle taking place. Do you want to see your families changed, your marriages? Do you want to see your working relationships changed? Do you want to see your church relationships changed? Do you want to see your impact on your neighbors changed? Then be marked as one who is truly in the Lord because your fights and quarrels are ruining things. The one who suffers the most is you. Even if you think, man, I'm going to give it to these guys. You're the one who's suffering. Because while you're wallowing in it, you could be living in righteousness. So what's the answer then? What's the answer to all of it? Our second point is submit to God. Submit to God. Well, that seems like the easy Sunday school answer. Submit to God. Got it. To submit to God is the outworking of a truly humble heart. The outworking of a truly humble heart. Some of us get to this point differently than other people. Some of us, God uses something that doesn't break us to bring us to the point of humbleness. Some of us had to go all the way to brokenness and the ground floor to figure out what it means to be humble before the Lord. But to truly confess and repent, to truly bring those things before the Lord. If I'm causing fights and quarrels among other people, am I doing an introspection to go, why am I doing that? Why am I always the one instigating things? Why am I the one that's always causing issues? Why am I the one, if I look back on it, again, you may think you're right in the moment, but when you step back, you go, eh, that wasn't the right thing to do. If that's always your response in your head, then what's causing these issues? Confess and repent and turn to the Lord. I mean, God went to such lengths. There was a divide between us. There was a divide that we could never cross that divide on our own. And God went to such lengths 
to send his son to die on a cross to completely close that gap that those who put their faith and trust in Jesus can have a personal relationship with him. And that personal relationship can be life-giving, joy-giving, hope-giving, peace-giving. And it can be something that we could experience even now before eternity. Well, when I get to heaven, it's going to be sweet. Why wait? Why drudge through the mud for the rest of your life and then go, when it gets the time to go to heaven, you are meant to live for him now. And how do we live? We submit to him. This is a weird thing for the world. If you're an unbeliever in here and you're like, man, I don't want to do that. I don't even want to submit to this person next to me. I don't want to submit to my boss. I don't even like that guy. I don't want to submit to my spouse. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this, that, whatever else. I don't want that. So how am I going to submit to an almighty God? But if you're a believer in here and you have that same response, it's an issue. Because it tells us that God does yearn jealously. Not in the thing sense that we yearn jealously. If we have jealousy in us, we've all struggled with that at one point or another, that's not love. That's a whole other th- bunch of things. It could be. But it's not love. When God is jealous, when the Bible uses, again, Bible uses words to try and help us understand things because we can never fully get the character of God fully in heavenly realms. But God's jealousy, unlike man's, is out of pure agape love. Again, a low shelf example of this is this. As a parent, your heart breaks when your children do dumb things. You might even be frustrated or angry also, but your heart breaks for them because you're like, if you would have just listened, I don't want to see harm for you. That's why I said, don't do that. In a much greater, more eternal sense, God's desire for us is to not sin, but to follow him. And when we choose the world and he lives within us, there is something deeper there. The Spirit desires to see us changed, and when we're filling with garbage and he can't live among sinful garbage, of course there's going to be a battle that wages in there. Well, I'm at angst in my walk with Christ. Okay, what are you filling yourself with? What are you walking in? How are you living your life? Of course you're going to be at angst if your Spirit lives within you and all you keep filling with is sin and trash. When we realize that the holy God who is outside of time and transcends the universe at the same time personally and passionately and lovingly jealously for our, is jealous for our affection because he loves us with an intensity that we can't even scoop a millimeter out of, shouldn't this realization stop our affairs? Shouldn't this stop us from having an affair with the world when we're supposed to be walking with our Lord? Let's say that again. When we realize that a holy God who is outside of time transcends the universe at the same time personally and passionately, the God who created everything stands outside, has all might and power and things in his hand, still hears you, loves you, wants to walk with you, wants to change you, wants you to make you more like him, What a beautiful picture. He's not throwing lightning bolts at you. He desires for you to change. Well, I think my sin from the past is why I'm going through what I'm going through. Possibly. But his desire is not to keep disciplining you, even though the Bible tells us he will discipline us. His desire is to use discipline to bring you back to joy and fullness in him. If you remain in discipline, it's because you remain in the need to be disciplined. When we submit to God, we will resist the devil. Those desires that cause conflict are not an issue when our heart is on the Lord and not on the things of this world. Every sin, oh, the devil made me do it. Every sin's an inside job. If you're a believer and the spirit lives within you, the devil can't make you do it. He doesn't have that authority or power to make you do it. Now, can he dangle shiny things in front of you and you go, oh, yes. Did he try to do it to the Lord? Yes, he tried to entice Jesus, which I always thought was interesting. I'll give you all of this. And Jesus is like, 
there's not one thing that has ever existed that I can't cry, it is mine. Well, I'm going to give it to you. The devil is dumb. The devil didn't make you do it. The spirit within you is greater than he that is in the world. The temptation and options that are thrown at you can be avoided, can be discarded, can be dealt with in Christ. We can stand and we can resist if we stand firm. How do we do it, though? I've always heard, resist the devil and he will flee from you. How, how do I do that? I mean, seriously, I can't see him. It's not like I can fight him. I'm not going to box him. So how do I resist him? How do I run from him? How do I deal with him in the right way? Well, first and foremost, humbly. You deal with the devil humbly, not humbly because he has some sort of power and authority, but because God does. And apart from God, we aren't going to resist anything. Because when the world entices us, if God does not entice us more, we're going to turn to what entices us the most. There's, in fact, there's this uh, study that was done where male butterflies... If you paint on a piece of cardboard a giant female-looking butterfly and you also, in the same room, put a real female butterfly, the male butterfly will always go to the giant cardboard butterfly, completely neglecting the actual real butterfly that's in the room. Every time. 100%. Because the giantness of it seems far more enticing than the realness. This world is a giant painted on cardboard butterfly. <laughs> and we constantly think, oh, that's what I want, when the real, authentic truth is there in front of us. We can humbly resist the devil because apart from God, God tells us that he gives us, in the passage we see, he gives us more grace. That's what it means. I will continue to pour my grace out on you as you pursue me to resist him faithfully. Secondly, we can resist him confidently. It doesn't go resist him and you have a shot. It says resist him and he will flee from you. When Jesus resisted him in the wilderness, and three times he said, nope. The devil, what did he have to do? The devil left immediately. Biblically and prayerfully is the third thing. Biblically and prayerfully. How does Jesus fight Satan? Through the word. He continuously repeats the word back to him, which we have to be careful because the devil also repeats the word uh, in the Bible also. But everything that the devil, and I've said this before, everything that the devil offers Jesus is the same thing that the prosperity gospel offers you today. And Jesus denied every one of those things. So how does Jesus fight? Through pr the word and prayer and as we see in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor every single day to confidently go to battle with the devil. And James goes on even further in verses 7 through 9. Like we, look, like we read earlier in the Beatitudes, he says, this is how you come to this point. If you've ever read the Beatitudes, this is Jesus' words. And I, I love the fact that we were able to read those today. Uh, I got to do a whole sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. It was, it was so, so life-giving and changing for me. But Jesus opened his mouth and said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. These are all acts and standings of humility. The Beatitudes draw us to this, and that's the same thing that he's saying. He's not saying, if you're a Christian, walk around with a pouty face. There's literally people in the Middle Ages and other times that thought that's what this meant. I need to walk around with a pouty face. I'm not supposed to be happy. I'm not supposed to have joy. I'm not supposed to experience anything of pleasure because James told me not to be pleasurable. And now he says, uh, mourn, weep, wail. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. That's not what it's talking about. This is true repentance. This is what repentance looks like. Brokenness leads to change. In the beginning, God created a perfect design. God's design was that we would live perfectly with him in all things and that in that design, it was supposed to be the perfect relationship. But sin came in. And through our sin, we were separated from God, every one of us. And all that sin ever does, no matter how much it looks good, tastes good, or whatever else, whether you come to recognize it or not, all it does is lead to brokenness. And in my brokenness, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of hope, doesn't seem to be joy, 
doesn't seem to be any sort of peace or comfort. There doesn't seem to be any sort of realness in my life but Christ. While we were still dead in our sins, Christ died for us, which leads to salvation, which leads us to repentance. If we repent of our brokenness and our sin, he will save us. Humility before the Lord, and he will exalt you. That's what it tells us in the passage. If you, if you humble yourselves, in verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord, he will exalt you. And that doesn't mean give you all the stuff you want, but you will have joy, you will have hope, you will have peace, you will be sanctified, you will live a life for him. And you have to be active in this. You can't just hope that your walk with Christ gets better. Finish with these few thoughts. A relationship with God is an actively engaged one. If your Bible's closed all week, you're not actively engaged in a relationship with Christ. If your prayers consist of, whenever something happens to me, I need to respond and thank God, hope that God will respond to my prayers, you're probably not experiencing the relationship with God. I mean, to address the earlier issue of fights and quarrels, do you know what will truly mark someone who has submitted to God? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Because when you are poor in spirit, you've mourned, you have saw the level of your depravity, you come to a point where, and it doesn't matter, if there's someone in this room who's done you wrong or, or if I've done you wrong and I don't know it yet, there's a moment in time where we are truly humble and penitent before the Lord that we come to a realization that says, no one, no one can do anything to me that is greater than what I did to Christ in my sin, nailing him onto the cross. Nothing. So if, I, if no one can do anything to me greater than what I did in my sin, that was the reason that held Christ to the cross, then I should be able to forgive others as they do something to me. So the mark of us, as we truly are penitent and come to know him, and the ones who will not fight and not quarrel are those who will forgive. It's not a worldly attribute. It's not, natural, it's not a nat natural attribute to the fallen man. This doesn't come by easily. I, I was the one who had to go to the bottom floor and be broken completely to understand this point. It is something distinct of the believer who has submitted that can forgive. If you find yourself at odds with others, if you find that you hold grudges, if you find that you are the victim or the hero of every situation, if you believe it is everyone else's fault when you're unhappy, then you probably don't understand what it means to submit to God because you don't understand what forgiveness is like and you don't understand what it means to repent and see your sin as it is before a holy God because then you're not going to hold everybody else's stuff against them. That's why it gets to the point of don't judge. Are we supposed to judge unbiblical things done by biblical people or, or, or Christians? Yeah, we're supposed to see those things. Like you, you say you're a Christian and you're doing this over here, those things don't compute, Th then we are. But as far as personal life to personal life as being better than somebody else, we're not supposed to because, again, if I get this before a holy God and that he has covered it with Christ's blood, then I want you, no matter what you've done to me, to have that same experience of forgiveness in Christ. For the good of the gospel, for the good of your witness, for the good of others, for the good of the church body, learn to truly forgive and have an attitude of forgiveness. Live out Philippians 2, 3 through 4, which was on that, one of the cards that we were memorizing. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Then, if we do so, we're not going to speak evil, as it says in verses 11 through 12. I'm not going to talk about people in a wrong way. I'm not going to gossip. How can I gossip against someone who I love and have forgiven? How can I gossip against a brother or sister in Christ that I love in Christ? How can I unrighteously judge others while blinded by a log of my own eye if I understand my sin before a holy God and want to see them come to know Christ truly? As with every part of James and every aspect of Scripture, I started with this, I'm ending it with it. It's a hard issue. It's a hard issue. So I'm going to ask these two questions. What is your heart issue? What is your heart issue? Believer, what is your heart issue today? Do you lack joy? 
Do you like peace? Do you like forgiveness for others? What is your relationship with Christ like? What is your walk with him like? What is your prayer life like? I'm not judging you. I'm just saying it won't be found in tryheartedness. It will only be found in prayerfulness and scripture. If you're lost in here, then what is your heart issue? Your heart issue is that you need a savior. And then maybe you've tried everything in the book. Maybe you've tried everything you can imagine. You've tried to fill your life with all kinds of stuff, and it's never landed at all. I can tell you why. Because you need Christ. And outside of Christ, there's no hope for any of us. So I don't stand up here and go, we're better. I stand up here and tell you, look, I'm a beggar who found the food. Christ drew me to the food. And I'm now a believer, and I want you as a beggar to come and find the food. That's what I want. You need a Savior. That's how our hearts can change. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. Lord, I'm so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you work on me all week through your word, that you pierce my heart, my soul, that I'm reminded that when I'm lacking joy, that when my attitude in my mouth say things that don't match up with my walk it's probably because i'm not where i need to be with you i'm glad that you have given us your word that it is life-giving that it can pierce us when it needs to pierce us it can comfort us it can grow us it can change us it can make us new for those in the room that know you lord i do pray this week that it wouldn't be through tryheartedness, but it would be through actual Pursuit. Start somewhere that we would start with just the smallest step in pursuit of you. And if someone's in this room that doesn't know you, I pray, God, that maybe today for the first time ever that they understood what it means to know you and be saved by you and they want to put their faith and trust in you. Lord, we're thankful. And we want to give you all the honor and glory and praise you are due. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.